introduce you to our lovely viewers here. I'm Erin Basler Francis. I work in disability services and I am a Masters of Education student at Widener University. <laughs> that was good, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my field of interest is the intersection of social skills, training, and sexuality for people with disabilities. Right, so uh, learning how to have relationships, what's appropriate, that kind of thing. Even something as basic as having a right to have a relationship that isn't family or staff or professional care related mm -hmm. is rare. It's rare. Yeah. I feel like that's something that most people don't really think about, even don't really process. And why, why do you think it is that most people just... Well, in the typically intelligent community, we do a lot of that intuitively as we grow up. Mm -hmm. it, with I work mostly with older adults who lived in institutions. They did not have the same sort of normative sexual upbringing that... Well, I mean, we're sexologists, so we didn't really have a normative sexual <laughs> upbringing. But <laughs> um, they... In institutional settings, it's either not spoken about and it's all done after lights out mm -hmm. and probably not in the most pleasant way right or it's treated retroactively when there's a problem as opposed to proactively to teach people skills mm -hmm. and it's getting a little bit better with integrated classrooms and special ed settings but integrated classrooms for younger people. for younger kids right. um, people coming up through special ed in public schools as opposed to institutions, which a lot of, a lot of institutions are closing. Really? The move is away from institutional living towards community-based placements. Mm -hmm. So, Do you think that's a better move? Or? There's positives and negatives. Um, it's better because people with disabilities, while they're still horribly stigmatized, aren't as stigmatized as when they were completely set away from society. Right, when nobody ever saw them, nobody had any experience or anything. But, my ultimate goal is to start a nonprofit that focuses solely on social skills and sexuality ed mm -hmm. without all of the paperwork and bureaucracy that goes along with working that through either the state agency or the... In Massachusetts we have the Umbrella State Department, DDS, okay. Department of Developmental Services, okay. and then there's 52 provider agencies. That sounds complicated. Yes. And then we have a group of people who have gone through specialized sexuality ed training. Really? And it's an eight-week training that for us. That doesn't sound like very much. It's not much, but it's way more than most people get. Most people That's don't true. even get an hour. So That's true. <laughs> it's, it's 64 hours for us, um, and we have a network that we work with. And most of those people are professional staffs. I'm one of the few just direct care people in there. Um, professional staff, teaching and learning, um, agency trainers for staff, they come through. Okay. And we get together and the idea, the way it started was they were, there was a desire to be able to provide free services mm -hmm. and develop a curriculum for people to use. But you always come up with, well, who's paying for the time? Who owns it? How do we distribute it? How do we market it? And that's right. And whose profit. agency is this for? Right. Because they're 52. And I was like, well, get rid of that. <laughs> and um, the idea is that the organization would take care of marketing, distribution, and um, sort of intake mm -hmm. to be able to distribute to people who are qualified through our training program and otherwise qualified, like, if you have someone who needs sign or someone who uses um, sign language, okay. you can't just send anybody in there. You have to have someone who can communicate right. with the person who needs services. Um, that makes sense. So you know, maybe one day I'll be my own boss and not have to worry about the political side of it. You could start, the, yeah, with the nonprofit. You'll mm -hmm. be your own boss. Um, since we have uh, people who are watching who probably don't really have any experience with people um, with intellectual disabilities. I always say it wrong, so I apologize that I'm probably mangling this. Um, do you have any like tips or things that you would like them to know about how to interact with somebody um, who has an, an intellectual development disability? There are probably two things that I would 
recommend. First is to remember that people with intellectual disabilities are people mm -hmm. and would like the same amount of respect that one in the typical intelligence community expects. And the second is to remember that one of the coping skills that is relatively common, I mean, in everyone, is if you don't understand, you just sort of play along ah, until you do. Okay. So yeah. it's, don't necessarily expect that you're being understood if you're explaining something abstract or high level and being able to sort of tease that out a little bit is important. How would you recommend that someone tease it out a little? Asking follow-up questions that are not yes or no. Oh, so, okay. Good or idea. like you would do with active listeners. <laughs> and yeah. you sort of ask them to kind of repeat what you've said in their own words. Mm -hmm. and Or what does that mean to you? That sort of thing. So, <laughs> Do you have any um, other areas of interest in the sexuality field? I have become more interested in the way that sexuality is represented for young girls. Really? I have two younger sisters, I have a bunch of younger cousins who are female, mm -hmm. and being the oldest and be not necessarily having forged my own path, but being a very I don't care what you think person, <laughs> and still seeing the way that um, images of you know supermodels everywhere, the beauty ideal and stuff, the way that affected me, not right. caring about mm -hmm. that stuff, mm -hmm. and how it potentially affects younger women is, that blows my mind. Oh, yeah. And now all my friends are having kids, and I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> oh wow. Yeah, that's, when your friends start having kids, that's definitely a, like, oh, okay. And just, I actually, I have a niece who's two and a half, and I had had a discussion with my sister-in-law about, we're both big, and I'm into the fat acceptance movement. And I try. I really try. But, I mean, when you come from big people, you're probably also going to be big. <laughs> and I come from mostly big people. But there's actually um, been a lot of studies about that, about, you know, the people who you know and the weights that they are mm -hmm. and it's how that affects people. Yeah. But I'm... She's worried about the way that will affect her daughter. And mm -hmm. I was so proud of her because she actually stood up to a family member and was like, if I ever hear you say blah 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 about my daughter being that you will not see her. Wow. And I was extremely proud of that. It made me happy. So that's really cool. It's good to see it going right. And I have <laughs> all of all of my friends are phenomenal parents and I'm glad to see that. And seeing these discussions happening and like open discussions about sexuality, like obviously not with their two year old, but they're preparing for it when their kid is two. Having to have those discussions, it's really cool to watch. Uh, that's definitely different than the way I grew up. Yeah. <laughs> You're right, yeah. I was Catholic school, and I actually, my mom was real cool about sexuality stuff. I, my mom is a clinician, so oh, okay. she's, she's a psychologist. And um, when I was young, when she was pregnant with my younger sister, when I was four, I, I asked her about how the baby had gotten in her belly. And we had a very frank discussion, sort of, reverse engineering how the baby got in there <laughs> and then the next day I went and told my best friend about it and got my first discussion about how there are some things that you just don't talk about with everybody. <laughs> right. I think that's probably one reason a lot of parents are afraid to talk about sexuality mm -hmm. with their children is uh, you never know what they're going to go they're into school They're waiting for shout. their loudmouth kids to go and talk to all their friends about how the baby got in there and traumatize their friends. I There's not enough attention paid to sexuality matters. And sexuality isn't just about sex, it's about self-esteem, mm -hmm. it's about body image, it's about how you interact with everybody. And it's such an integral part, it needs to be part of the discussion about everything. It certainly does. We, we get a lot of um, sex education stuff that's all oriented towards physicality and all that kind of thing, but um, you don't hear much about, well, it's also relationship skills mm -hmm. and making good decisions mm -hmm. and... I definitely didn't get any of that. I had to do all of that on my own by practice. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah. Um, uh, during the Bush administration, there was money given federally to local municipalities, and I think it was actually on the state level. The money was given out and then doled out mm -hmm. for abstinence-only education. Right. 
and our governor in Massachusetts, Deval Patrick, who is a Democrat, although apparently people on Facebook don't realize that. Um, <laughs> that was weird. Um, he actually refused the federal, the extra federal money for education because he refused to teach abstinence-only education. Probably because he saw all the studies that said it doesn't work. <laughs> Imagine that. Abstinence-only education leads to things like higher teen pregnancy because nobody knows what the fuck they're doing and they think if you put an aspirin in your vagina after sex, you won't get pregnant. Dude, I totally had anal sex before I had vaginal sex because I thought, well, I'm still a virgin. Yeah, I can't. I can't get anything. Yeah, from that. are you fucking stupid? <laughs> or the kids were like, "Well, it's just oral sex. It's not sex." And it's like, yeah. it's still a very intimate activity from which you could get STDs. There are, like, its last name <laughs> is sex. It's yeah, it's still sex. Yeah, it's like telling me I'm not a basler because <laughs> my first name is Aaron. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. You're a basler. What? Uh, no. no, 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 no. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much for coming and uh, interviewing and, uh, you know, taking time away from the party. Mm, I'm going to go get another beer. And I'm Sounds excited. Like this was perfect timing. <laughs>